Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeremy Jurgens, Managing Director of the World Economic Forum and Head of the Center on the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, we're joined here uh, today by a distinguished panel of uh, Nita Farani, Amandeep Singur, and Gary Marcus to discuss Mind in the Machine. We'll be doing a general briefing uh, for the folks here in the room as well as our online audience on the state of neurotechnology, implications to benefit uh, across a range of areas, and also uh, what the implications are in terms of access, privacy, and human rights. Now, to kick off the panel, I'd like to invite uh, Nita Farani uh, to share with us a little bit more on the current landscape. Now, Nita, you know, I understand that uh, the market has been growing significantly. Uh, recent uh, research shows I think it's over $7 billion a year of investment. There's close to 1,200 companies uh, operating in this space. And the market's expected to grow to $27 billion. And I believe that many of our viewers may not be aware that actually the market was so large. So could you actually share a little bit with us on what that landscape looks like? Sure. So um, uh, let me begin by saying it depends on what we're talking about from when we're talking about neurotechnology. And I think a lot of it gets grouped together under a single umbrella. Um, and it's useful to divide the world up uh, between what is implanted neurotechnology for therapeutic purposes, um, where there are a number of, of companies that have made extraordinary advances over the past few years in moving through clinical trials to be able to do things like potentially restore movement or to give people back self-determination who, uh, for example, are, are quadriplegics or unable to communicate verbally or through eye movements to get those brain signals out and to be able to communicate with devices uh, more directly. That is a limited subset, but some of them have moved to phase three clinical trials, and a lot of them are looking at how do they make these devices less invasive? Um, are there different mechanisms, miniaturization of the technology or ways to get it into the brain in ways that are less um, traumatic from a surgery perspective or otherwise, and is something that could go to scale? There are hundreds of thousands of people who stand to benefit from the therapeutic benefits that that offers. On the other side um, are wearable devices. So these are brain sensors uh, that are starting to be embedded in everyday devices, but until now have been a number of niche companies that really have focused on mindfulness and meditation. The use of, for example, brain sensors that can pick up electrical activity in the brain at a pretty low resolution, but advances in AI have both improved what the signal is that can come from the brain um, and enabled the miniaturization uh, of those products. As a lot of the major tech companies start to invest um, in these brain sensors, it's a huge, I think, untapped market in many ways of integrating them into everyday devices. These are earbuds or watches or headphones and the soft cups around the ears. Many of those products are hitting the market this year and others are hitting them within the next two years such that people can listen to music, a phone call, et cetera, while having those devices in ears. I think in many ways it's that latter category that presents the more significant set of ethical challenges. The former is very tightly re regulated by existing medical oversight. The latter is bringing the kinds of sensors that people have become accustomed to, such as rings and in watches, into everyday devices, but it breaches the final frontier of privacy, that is, what people are thinking and feeling. Initially, what they will be capable of doing is very high-level brain state reading, things like, are you tired? Are you paying attention? Is your mind wandering? Are you happy or sad? Um, they maybe enable interaction, like up, down, left, right, for interaction with other technologies. And they're being embedded into things like um, visual, uh, virtual reality headsets. Um, three major ethical issues I'll just put on the table. One is the context in which they'll be used. When used by individuals to gain better insights into their personal health and well-being, um, this is a great use case for people to gain greater introspection and interoception. When used coercively, for example, in an educational setting or in a workplace where people are mandated to have their brain activity monitored, it becomes deeply problematic that this final frontier of privacy is one that people can't reclaim. 
The second ethical issue is the inclusivity of the data. A lot of the data sets that have been built until now in many ways are biased because they've excluded people um, of different skin colors, for example, or different hair types that interfere with the sensors. The result is that a lot of the data is skewed, and if the data is skewed and high stakes decisions like hiring and firing or workplace decisions are being made about individuals or about children in classrooms, that is, also deeply concerning. And the last and deeply concerning area um, of ethical concern is the aggregation and the collection of this data, especially in a world in which most business models for major tech companies have been based on the aggregation of personal data in ways that allow them to gain insights into about individuals, but also allow, for example, targeted advertisement, um, the use of uh, kind of closed loop systems that change environments in response to people's data that could nudge them and coercively shift how they think and they feel. Brain data in particular, or cognitive biometrics, the broader class of data from eye tracking and other information, needs to, from my perspective, be kept on device and overwritten, such that the raw data where discrimination or other types of concerns could arise um, are very limited and safeguarded by individuals through encryption and other on-device protections. Great. Thank you, Anita. And I think you also go into depth in this in your book, which I quite yeah. enjoyed and uh, would you. recommend to uh, everyone who hasn't already had a chance to read that there. Thank you. I'd like to go to Amandeep Singh Guild next, uh, the uh, technology envoy for the uh, United Nations. And you've been actively looking uh, at the human rights around these issues. And you know, what with, with what we've heard from Nita and the work that you've been doing, what are the essential frameworks to ensure that we protect the human rights of citizens while actually uh, allowing them to gain the benefits that these technologies can provide? Right. I, I, w I want to start um, straight away by um, uh, endorsing what Nita just said. I think uh, there's a shift in the industry uh, it, very similar to what's happening with the uh, AI uh, industry, um, most of the investments in the private sector, and um, uh, technology is getting smart, but not smart enough, but it's being rushed to the market because the business opportunity is there. Uh, I use a variable, uh, it still confuses light, sleep, and meditation. It's getting smarter, but you know it's not there with this, this uh, wealth to be created, so people are rushing in and corners are being cut. So that's worrying. And this brings me to this question about uh, the frameworks that need to be applied. I think we have a very strong existing framework of international human rights law. Um, uh, and there are these core conventions, um, and they are fully applicable to this area as they are to other areas of technology. Uh, there is an ethical dimension to it, um, particularly at the early stages of innovation when it's not clear what kind of legal frameworks apply. And there, um, my colleagues in UNESCO are working on this issue in partnership with the Office of the High, Commission, High Commissioner on Human Rights uh, uh, in Geneva. Uh, in New York, um, um, the Secretary General is worried about the lack of uh, effective implementation of these uh, frameworks. There was a discussion um, a couple of years back um, within the UN system, do we need new kind of human rights around this? I think the jury is still out. We decided that for practical purposes, we should double down on what exists and their effective implementation. Some countries are putting in place specific laws, uh, but I think we need to speed up, uh, and for that, we need to rely on existing uh, frameworks. Okay. Thank you, Amadeep. Um, I'd like to shift next to Gary Marcus, a Professor Emeritus at New York University. Um, you've uh, you know, been active in the cognitive science and uh, technology fields for some time. And earlier, we were also were discussing around, you know, once we start seeing the uh, convergence of AI in neuroscience and what implications that has for future evolution in this space. So, I look at this both as a cognitive neuroscientist retired and as also an AI researcher who's mostly been looking at AI policy lately. And as a cognitive neuroscientist, I look at what's there and I say there's still a long way to go before the most scary scenarios where you put on 
let's say a VR device that has sensors and it could read your thoughts. Like I really don't want to do that. I'm not too worried about that happening in the short term. I think we might find video games where you can kind of move a character left or right. That's not the same as really uh, reading your thoughts. We might see that relatively soon. Um, as a neuroscientist, I think getting to the point where you put something on your head and it can read your thoughts in a fully general way without your cooperation is still going to take some time. We still don't really understand how the brain works. We're still in early days of neuroscience. We're collecting data. We're collecting much higher resolution data than we did before, but we still have limited understanding of how all that data works. You have 86 billion neurons in, in your brain, and we have no idea exactly what they're all doing. Um, as an AI researcher, though, I'm very sympathetic to the arguments that, that my co-panelists have made. Um, you, know, you can see with AI that we're very late to the game. Um, you know, All of a sudden, we have ChatGPT. It has all kinds of implications, and, and we don't really have any laws uh, that are specific to AI yet. We have a bunch of initiatives that are close, and then um, and different governments are, are doing different kinds of things. The UN is, is trying to do things. But we're clearly playing catch up. And I think we should use this opportunity right now to think of some of the same uh, questions that arise in general in AI have implications here. So around privacy, for example, and the aggregation of data, as we're constructing our, our laws and, and norms and so forth around AI, we should be thinking about the, these issues issues in, in neurotechnology. And I'll just throw out one worry uh, beyond the, the excellent list that Nita already made, which is there's, there's a whole set of things around hacking and bad actors. So for example, if you have some headset and it communicates over Bluetooth, Bluetooth is just not that secure. And so right now, probably it can't read too much, but it can probably read your emotional state to some degree. Someday it might be able to read your thoughts. You know, you don't want people to be able to hack into that. And then there's another version, which I think is you know, very far away, but we should still be thinking about, which is most of these things are kind of read and not write, but there are um, technologies like TMS that do try to write signals to the brain, and I'm sure people are going to try to do that for various reasons. Um, imagine those systems being hacked. So you know, we really want to think this through. We want to get a jump on it. I think that's Nita's fundamental point. I completely agree with it. You know, no matter how long the timescales are on some of the specifics, we need to get on it. Great. Thank you. Um, Nita, I'd like to come back to you. You know, uh, I was discussing with some AI researchers here and, you know, deep in the field, long time, and said, you know, chat GPT, the LLMs, you know, the attention knows all you need paper, actually accelerated uh, much faster uh, the field of AI than even the uh, expert researchers had anticipated. You know, some say anywhere moving it up from 10 to 15 years sooner the things that are happening today than they otherwise expected. What's your thought also on this uh, timeline, and do you think it's as far out as Gary does, or do you think there's also potential that it could uh, come more quickly? I think it's coming much more quickly thanks to advances in generative AI. So um, the papers that have come out just over the past year applied to much more complex um, imaging, so using things like functional magnetic resonance imaging where people go into a scanner cooperatively, intentionally having their brain activity scanned while they listen to podcasts or they see images um, are being, in many instances, very reliably recreated thanks to generative AI. Now, that doesn't apply to EEG and small sensors. There's still a gap between that kind of technology and wearable sensors. But what it shows um, and what a lot of the companies are now talking about is the capacity of using generative AI to have a classifier on device for individuals. So as um, they launch a product on the marketplace that allows you to do really basic things, track your stress levels throughout the day, which is a powerful insight that people can gain about their own brain health and wellness, it will learn the individual and co-evolve over time so that each device will have a personal classifier for an individual that generative AI enables that can learn brain signals over time and be able to you know, essentially say, when you are thinking this or you want to type this or you're experiencing this, this is what the brain activity looks like. That co-evolution is happening so much more quickly that it allows companies to ship products with very basic functionality that then also allows this co-evolution. 
the good thing is those classifiers don't seem to apply across people. So some of these studies have shown that when a classifier is trained for a particular person and then you try to apply it to somebody else's brain signals, it doesn't translate across. And so if we put into place now measures that really secure the privacy of the classifier as well as the data that's being aggregated, this could be potentially transformative technology for brain health and wellness and more seamless interaction with other technology but only if we put into place the design measures as well as really updating our interpretation of existing human rights around freedom of thought and privacy and self-determination to align with the rights of individuals around that data. Okay, thank you. Amadeev, I'd like to come back to you after hearing both from uh, Gary and Nita there. Um, you're in discussion with a lot of policymakers, uh, government leaders, and you know, Gary was highlighting, for example, the security concerns on top of the technology that could actually interfere there. Do you feel there's a sufficient understanding among policymakers and government leaders, uh, both on the capabilities of the technology currently, how quickly it's moving, and what advice would you have on you know, improving uh, understanding of these uh, capabilities? The short answer is no. So we need to raise awareness of the capabilities and I think we need more diversity in terms of the messaging around these technologies because often policymakers just get one kind of messaging, which is that uh, this is going to solve uh, some health problems um, that are, you know, that, that you relate to in a very emotional way. Um, uh, so um, we need a more nuanced conversation around that, and that's what we've been trying to promote. Uh, through the ethics lens, the human rights uh, lens, and also the AI governance lens. You know, I think this point about the convergence that both Nita and uh, Gary have made, it's very important because you, you are able to read brain signals today, process them. Signal processing has been with us for a while. But now you are able to process signals in a significantly different way. You have these papers coming out of Stanford from Japanese researchers. Uh, so uh, uh, I worry at this stage about you know silly use, stupid use, um, and that would then uh, create problems uh, for the field as a whole, which is at a very early stage of evolution. The good science, the good applications would get uh, uh, constrained. So we need to create a more re uh, reasoned uh, debate uh, around this. And the participation of the private sector is crucial. This is one thing, frankly, we are struggling with at the United Nations. How to bring the startups, the companies that are actually developing these technologies into this uh, conversation. Okay, thank you. Gary, any additional thoughts? I just, I have, I'll, I'll give a metaphor that I think should be out there, um, which is these tools are gonna become Trojan horses, right? I think this is at the heart of what Nita is really saying, is we're gonna see like, things like the Apple Vision Pro, maybe not, I'm not sure Apple would do this, but we'll see other vendors do this, and Apple's strong on privacy, but others will be less strong on privacy, and they will use this to train classifiers and so forth. I might be slightly, uh, and my pr predictions on how fast people can make something of like that might be slightly slower than, than need is, but the general point is absolutely true. They're gonna be Trojan horses. You know, you should think about Facebook, right? You know, you thought you were talking to your friends, and really what they've been doing is accumulating this very detailed data and working with other vendors which will happen here too, to get as detailed a representation of you as possible to sell you personalized ads and so forth. We're gonna see the same thing here where these are Trojan horses. Um, and then the other thing that I think makes policy complicated is that the pace of development here is really not predictable. That 2017 paper that you mentioned didn't even win a best paper award at NeurIPS that year. Um, you know, people thought, okay, this is one more paper in this genre, and turned out to you know, have pretty profound implications. I still think we're a long way from artificial general intelligence, but there are a lot of practical things we can do with this technology. We don't really understand the pace. So you know, we can go over, we can have a drink and, and argue about a little bit, but none of us really know how fast this is moving. Um, it's certainly gonna move reasonably fast, and it's certainly going to, this kind of technology is gonna be used as a Trojan horse, and we need to think about that. Great, thank you. I'd like to use this opportunity to also open it up to the audience for questions and comments. And maybe I can also 
proactively uh, invite uh, Jared Gimser for comment. Uh, Jared, renowned human rights uh, lawyer, uh, but also a co-founder of the Neuro Rights Foundation. Uh, you've had a chance to hear this. You've also been looking at it personally. Um, any observation on what you've heard here, and what question would you put to the audience, or to the uh, panel here? Uh, well, thanks so much. Um, it's not very exciting for me to say that I agree substantially with pretty much what everyone is saying. I do fall on the side of uh, this is moving faster rather than slower. Um, you know, I'm working with one of the world's leading experts on neurotech, Rafael Uste, who says that things that he thought would take five years are now taking one or two. So I think we're moving faster, and also because a billion dollars a year is being spent just by China alone through its military on researching neurotech. And I'm quite confident that they're working on, uh, even though I have no personal knowledge, decoding human thoughts, potentially using these devices for torture and, and other kinds of things. Um, I'll just make a, uh, my brief comment is that our foundation is coming out with a study to try to bring some data to the quest uh, these questions uh, in the next two weeks uh, on a review of 30 consumer neurotech products that are publicly available for purchase and reviewing the user agreements and then benchmarking them against international standards across 15 thematic areas. And it probably is no surprise to hear that uh, across those 30 companies, uh, all of them own your full brain scan, even though they only need a small part of it. Um, and all but one uh, allows th that company to sell or otherwise transfer the data. We're not saying it's because these are bad actors, but exactly as uh, Mr. Gill said, uh, we're at very early stages and people don't know what best practice is or how to do it. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. So the question I would have is, uh, for, for the panelists is I think we're all in agreement this is moving fast. How do we move the international system faster? Our foundation is working at the national level in the US, Chile, Brazil, and Mexico to do national regulation, but uh, would very much be interested to hear any great ideas we have for how to make people understand that this is a today problem, not a tomorrow problem. Great, who'd like to take that first? Yeah, Amadeep, can I go to you? I think that's a great question. Um, how do we, I mean, we've made the case that things need to move faster on the governance side, on the awareness side, but how do we make that happen? Uh, there's a conference that UNESCO is organizing uh, on this. Uh, and uh, in New York, there is the Summit of the Future where a global digital compact is to be adopted. How can we reinforce the principled approach uh, to these technologies? How can we put in place some concrete commitments and actions and some kind of a review and follow-up mechanism because the tech is moving fast and we need to make sure that, you know, as we update our understanding of how existing obligations apply, uh, we are keeping in step with the technology. So I see those couple of uh, opportunities, uh, but I think we need to work harder on bringing the industry together. Um, uh, the forums work on this issue could be uh, helpful in that regard. Um, and if there is a safe space, because I, from my experience of the lethal autonomous weapons discussion, some of the investors, some of the companies were reluctant to join the discussion because they feared being branded as uh, makers of killer robots and so on. So can we you know, work on this problem and create the conditions for uh, those multi-stakeholder conversations to happen? Can I add yeah. to that? And if there's anyone else with questions in the audience, please raise your hand and we'll come to you after uh, each other. Just briefly adding to that, so um, agreed a principled approach can help us get there more quickly. Um, part of what uh, the work I've been doing has looked at is, you know, in this bridge that we're talking about with AI, as well as other emerging technologies, there's a consistent theme across all of them. It isn't just neurotechnology that's seeking to decode brain and mental experiences. It's, you mentioned Apple ProVision, their eye tracking capabilities really are meant to make inferences about mental experiences and to try to understand what we're thinking and feeling. A lot of these technologies, if you think about a broader class of cognitive biometrics, are raising the same issue. And so rather than a technology by technology approach, recognizing that especially with the urgency that everyone feels with respect to AI, it can be governed across a principled approach across all of them. We can recognize that there is this fundamental right to cognitive liberty and that that maps on to existing human rights of self-determination and mental privacy and, um, and freedom of thought. And, and we can recognize that that's true, whether it's social media that's seeking to understand our psychological profiles, it's eye tracking or it's neural data that's being collected, which gives the urgency because those products are already on the market and it allows us to be able to meet this technology as it arrives more broadly on the market. 
I'll just add one thing, which is um, I was really struck by what you said about terms of service and shouldn't be surprised by it because people are signing similar times, terms of service with their cars and the cars are tracking where they're going and you know possibly sharing data with Meta and so forth. Um, one thing I think that this does point to is we need firmer consumer advocacy and um, uh, literacy campaigns around what you are signing and why it actually matters. And somehow we're not getting that message out. And this is you know one more place where it's really going to matter, matter, maybe matter even even more than it has before. Okay. Thank you. Okay, a uh, question there in the front. Um, thank you for such an interesting panel so far. It's been really interesting to get your perspectives on this issue, given it's such a prominent topic. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you ensure that you still get the benefits of AI, given that uh, regulations are so important in this case, but how do you make sure that we still get the best benefits, for example, in maybe a mental health perspective, where it could help things like therapies or people who have um, issues that need to be addressed and where AI could help in such a way? How do you make sure that your regulations are kind of allowing for that to happen? It's a great question, and I'll say um, most people who are kind of fervently working on these issues recognize the biggest risk comes from um, the raw data itself, right? So if you have, rather than an inference that has to be drawn, if you want to go left and right, um, the richness of brain data is such that there are a lot of other inferences that could be made if it was accessible to the individual. Those other inferences include, for example, aggregating large data sets to be able to learn about mental health and well-being. But there's a way to do that, which is if data lives on device and some people choose to participate in studies that allow the study of very specific issues, depression, ADHD, um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, much like um, the very large Apple Heart Health study that they did, which led in collaboration with um, a university under an IRB, a consented to process of sharing data that was for a limited purpose, they are able to gain tremendous insights from that. That same thing can happen if suddenly we're tracking our everyday brain health and wellness and our everyday brain activity, there is a wealth of data there. There is a respectful and individual privacy preserving way of studying that data to gain the insights that can benefit humanity. Great, thank you. And maybe uh, building on that last question, also starting with Gary and then working this way, uh, could you build further on the opportunities you see in the space? A lot of the discussions here are focused on the clear need to protect privacy, uh, build consumer understanding. What do you see as the key opportunities emerging in this space that we also want to make sure that we don't miss? I mean, the short-term ones are, are certainly like helping people that are paralyzed be able to walk again and so forth, um, hel helping people that are blind. Like some of that I think is relatively close and is going to have a major impact. Um, I think that helping with depression and other, other mental disorders is something that is relatively feasible in, in the relatively near future. I mean, always these things, we, we try them out and then, you know, it's sort of like phase three clinical trials, a lot of them don't work. So, you know, not every shot on goal is going to work, but I think we have more and more shots on goal and we'll really be able to help people with uh, mental health issues. I think if we get the laws right so that we're not having this kind of Trojan horse problem, then I think there's a lot of potential um, to help with those kinds of things. In the long term, um, well, I actually wrote, uh, in 2008, I wrote a piece for the New York Times about um, having systems that automatically help us with our memory and our reasoning and so forth. And that is possible. I wouldn't even want people to play around with them, though, until we get these privacy issues um, correct first. Yeah, Amadi? Yes, I think that leads to the learning and education opportunity. Uh, but I think we won't get there if we have reckless use of this technology. In fact, it'll, it'll be um, uh, unhelpful. Uh, there are, uh, we are faced with aging populations, demographics are changing very rapidly, so brain health, um, the uh, percentage of brain health related problems as a subset of uh, overall health related problems is rising. So th there is a tremendous opportunity there um, societal, uh, for societal uh, well-being. And that's why I'm very concerned um, about not getting this right at this stage because of the opportunity that's out there. I will echo those and add one final thing, which is we know personally virtually nothing about what's happening in our own brains. Um, we're able to track the number of steps we take a day, a day, know our heart rate and other basic metrics, but this part of ourselves that we so closely identify with, we have this just very inaccurate way of accessing. And so the possibility of making transparent to ourselves what's happening in our own brains, whether that's for mindfulness, meditation, stress levels, depression, or just being able to know yourself better, that to me is a really promising for 
forefront um, beyond the incredible promise that we could have with respect to disease, with respect to neurological disorders and movement disorders that um, we could really seek to make true inroads on in, in, as this technology continues to develop. Great. Um, thank you. If I could just briefly summarize, um, what I've heard here is, you know, we have a rapidly evolving landscape. It's not well understood <clears throat> by the general public, uh, let alone business leaders or policymakers. And this is something that we need to work on further and develop consumer literacy and individual literacy so people understand how to protect their uh, own privacy uh, and safety in those dimensions. We have existing laws and frameworks. We need to see how we put those fully to use and then building on that to see where, whether further work is needed. And also being able to differentiate between what's taking place in the medical technology where we see amazing benefits and potential, especially for traditionally disadvantaged people that didn't have access uh, to society and to interaction. Uh, while you know, managing also for the consumer tech where the standards are not always up to what they need to be uh, to protect citizens in this uh, environment. And I think also from Amandeep, the need to make sure that we have an inclusive participation uh, there of the private sector and industry, but I would also include here civil society uh, into that group uh, so that we can navigate this future space. So thank you for joining us on today's session on neurotechnology, and uh, thank you as well to the panelists. Thank you.